With that, we will start off announcements. Yeah, the other thing is to see whether it's the sport. Yeah, I like it on the sometimes Off and on. Yeah, we're going to be very interesting. We came across a massage uh, machine that someone left here. So, no, you don't do it, I'll do it. It's a community meeting for the police. There's two names on it. Um, I don't remember who brought it in, so if it's yours, please see me. Uh, yeah. Can you keep giving them a Okay. Uh, Okay, hello. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Sean, I live over on North Champlain Street, and I'm uh, part of the uh, Burlington Bike Park Coalition, building a bike park here in Burlington, Vermont. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Good. And um, we're holding our first fundraiser at Outdoor Gear Exchange on June 20th. Uh, we're selling tickets to a movie premiere of Return to Earth, which is a rad mountain bike film. You know, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> It'll be a good time. Uh, we'll also be having raffle prizes, etc. It all goes towards building our bike park. Um, we have a, a location that we're working on right now, so you can learn more about that on the 20th, or you can come see me with questions, or if anybody has a place they can put up posters for the event, that would be great. Thanks. Hello, so I just want to give everybody an update on City Hall Park. We filed an amended complaint with, his, with the court on Tuesday, which took note of the fact that the city's permit to reconstruct, to cut down the trees and reconstruct the park expired on March 22nd. So we're asking the court to enforce the permit, including its provision that it expires if no work is done within a year of the issuance of the permit, which ended March 22nd. So we're looking forward to getting a response from the city. We don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they'll have some good response. But if, the, if they do have to get a new permit, then we're hoping everyone will come and testify again as to why they should not reconstruct City Hall Park. The walkways are perfectly good the way they are, and if they keep the walkways where they are, they won't have to cut down any trees. Do we have any more public announcements? Please come on up. If you do, please just filter up and we'll hand you a microphone. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah. I work at a new place. Um, we're a transitional housing facility for the homeless on North Street. And I just wanted to make everyone aware of an upcoming volunteer opportunity with a new place and a bunch of other um, homeless service organizations in Burlington. A lot of them are in the Old North End. Um, we're having a serve week at the end of July. You can read about it at anewplacevt.org slash serve week. Every morning and evening we're going to have a different opportunity. We're also raising money from Low Barrier Shelter, which is formerly the Winter Warming Shelter. And it's a really great way to learn about homelessness and about some of the organizations that are working to serve the homeless population. So I really hope to see some of you volunteering. Thank you. A new place, vt.org slash serve week. Any other announcements? I just want to mention on Saturday the 29th, the um, Old North End Dumpster Day occurs, which is going to be at the um, parking lot of the Integrated Arts Academy. I don't know the exact hours, but I think it starts around 8.30 or so. It's going to be 8 to 8 to 12, there's also going to be a free pile. A free pile, 8 to 12, Jean has the details. But, so, the 29th, it's a free, it's an opportunity to get rid of stuff that otherwise is difficult to get rid of. We don't really hope people bring their household trash, but really stuff that they just can't get rid of. Spare tires, old no, equipment that doesn't tires, work. Sorry. We can get rid of them. I know where to get rid of tires. We can take them down. No, we just take them down. I take them down to Pine Street. I load up my vehicle and I transport the tires. So, we will make it happen. Bring your stuff, please. Bring your stuff. Anyone else? Any more announcements? Going once, twice. Okay, thank you guys. Next on our agenda, we're going to bring up Mary Danko from the Public Library. We're running a little bit ahead of time. Okay. Tony, Tony's very excited. We have something for public forum. We'll give you, we'll give you two minutes for this as well. First, I'm glad that uh, uh, Police Chief uh, is here. Uh, he always in the metrics, and uh, 
I think we all know we've learned in the New North uh, in the North uh, uh, Avenue and South excuse me, in the Winiski Avenue's corridor study, citywide we have 150 injuries each year. Uh, uh, car injuries and people who are hit by a bicycle or a pedestrian. We actually have one pedestrian or a cyclist hit once a week here in the city. Ten percent of those um, are on, uh, north, on the Winooskies. And that's a real concern that we have uh, really unsafe streets. And uh, I hope that the uh, metrics will cause the police department to look at how we reduce that. We have three pieces of paper that we've handed out. I have extra copies. One is Make Winooski Avenue's Road its greatest and safest street. Uh, know that Jack did the planning on it. And uh, Mr. Faber are here who are working and representing us. Uh, I think it's, uh, they're doing a good, good, good job. And I think that we need to look uh, for the best street, the greatest street in the city. It's not Main Street. It's not North Avenue. It's the Little Street. Uh, also, Champlain Parkway. Uh, we went to uh, work on Thursday, thanks for seven days, giving us a little publicity uh, because they have a slow news week. Uh, we're hoping that uh, we can stop the construction there and that we can have, again, uh, the city should be concerned about the fact that it's a black hole when it comes to safety of any type, uh, and uh, particularly for those who walk the bike. Um, I hope you'll look at one of the three sheets here, the ABC of what St. Street is, making the Whiskey's the greatest street in the city. And third, background on the Champlain Parkway, I call it, some of us call it the, Shim, the Champlain Parkway, and that we need to redesign it in using 21st century approaches rather than the 20th century uh, uh, terrible design and urban design we have now. Thank you, Kevin, for your good time meeting, and I'll leave it to the person who to have a public forum statement. Just been reminded, please um, state your name when you, when you start your announcement. Do we have anyone else that wants to come up for a public forum or any announcements? Hi, my name is Mayumi Cornell, and I just wanted to say I have some real issues when it comes to people biking not only on the roads, but on the sidewalks. If you can't see the person, you can't move out of the way. And it's becoming a real issue. Um, we have some new immigrants. They don't know the rules, so I don't know what outreach there is for that. But it's really, really, really important that if the police see something, they need to do something because it's getting really, really bad. Because... Sidewalks are for walking. I don't know what the what the bikers can do. They have some bike lanes they don't use some on Pine Street because it's too dangerous. So it's quite having bike lanes that are too dangerous. Um, I recommend something be done about that. But when I was a small girl in Idaho of all places, we had to get a license, just like a car, a very small license, at the police department. We had to show that we knew how to use signals, and you had to have lights, and you had to have reflectors in order to get that. Otherwise, you were illegally using them. But I think that's a good way to Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to say we have two more people at most, two minutes each. Carol. Okay, I wasn't going to say anything. But bikes things have been bothering me for a long time. I live on North Street and I constantly see bikers do not stop at the light. They ride in the road. They do not follow the, the rules of the road. So if you're going to ride in the road, please, please, please follow the rules. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps there's interest for a future MPA discussion about biking in the older event. Um, okay, now I'm going to ask Mary Danko up for real this time. Thank you for joining us today. And
Hello, my name is Mary Dango and I'm the Library Director for the Fletcher Free Library. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about our strategic plan. Before I became the library, my predecessor had been working on the strategic plan in 2016 and so when I came on in 2017 it was like 95% done. We finished it up, we tweaked it a little bit and we've been working on it. So in the agenda and I believe in the minutes would be a link. So if you could take a survey to kind of let us know how we're doing so far. It goes through 2020. Um, I didn't bring a lot of the hard copies. It's probably better to look at it online if you can, but we do have the strategic plan there. Uh, and that all, we did that process, that all came out of, I don't know if some of you remember, we went to all the MPAs, we had focus groups, we met with stakeholders, did quite a bit of interviews, and that's what brought that about, and now we're just kind of trying to take another look at it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Brian, right. here. Eric, could you just talk about what you're doing to the uh, home-based child care? Oh, okay, so Brian's referring to a new program that we have piloted, and it's called the Early Literacy Outreach Program, and it is going to home daycares and bringing a literacy story time program to home daycares. When we first started, we had one person doing it. We're trying to identify um, home cares that are zero to three stars, if you're familiar with the star system rating that these home daycares get. And now we're in um, phase two. It's good that you asked this question, actually, uh, because we are now training volunteers to go out into the home daycares. So we have another training coming up on June 22nd. So if you have any interest in doing this, um, you can go onto the website and apply. Uh, it is a one-year commitment, and you go to a home daycare for um, an hour once a week, but we provide you with the kit with the books, with the songs, with the materials, and I have to tell you, it is extremely rewarding. It's a win-win. I will just tell you one story. Um, now that we're in phase two, we have a, um, we've been keeping in touch with our volunteers, and one of our volunteers wrote us and said, when they come in the door, all the kids yell, the library lady's here, the library lady's here. So of course that makes me very emotional. Um, but that's that's the kind of impact that you're having on these kids. Oftentimes the home daycare providers um, are working very long hours. They can't get out of their homes. Um, so when a volunteer comes, you're giving them a little bit of respite as well. Thanks. Any other questions? We raise our hands high if you have a comment or a question, please. Oh, um, I think I asked this of Emer when she presented at another MPA. What, um, and I might have missed a little bit of it, but what events are going on at the library this summer for um, all ages? Can you, can you list a few of them? There's a lot. <laughs> so I think our, our next big, um, we have summer reading, I'm going to correct that, it's called Summer Challenge Program now. A lot of trends you're seeing in public libraries is it's not just about reading over the summer, it's about all kinds of learning engagement. So we have things going on for our early learners, youth, teens, and this year we even have adults. Adults, if you can come to programs and read books, you can uh, enter a raffle to win something. Uh, but I would suggest going to our website. I believe our next big, our big kickoff for the youth is Sunday, June 23rd, and that's going to be uh, a big event. But there's, it's tons throughout the whole summer. Any other questions? Thank you. And I just, if you would please um, fill out the survey, I promise it's very, very short, and we can really um, look at that input and use it to guide our work. So thank you very much. Um, next, we have on the agenda. Um, we have James Kerrigan and Ali Zaparo coming to talk about Jake's Old North End Market and Mascoma Bank opening up in our neighborhood. Um, hello, uh, my name is James Kerrigan. Um, together with my family, we're we'll reopening uh, Jake's One Market in the old CarQuest store um, in, on North Mooski. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to let me speak here and also to join 
uh, the business community in the neighborhood. Um, our mission will be to bring uh, healthy and affordable foods to the neighborhood. Um, and uh, over the next four or five months, we're going to be um, spending a lot of time and energy uh, to make that happen. Um, some of you may have noticed that the building behind the CarQuest store came down this week. Uh, but starting in July, there will be a lot of construction activity on the property. Um, there will be a whole new front of the building, um, a new sidewalk and canopy, um, central Asian market. Um, we'll also get a new fresh look, um, and we're going to go in there and be a complimentary business um, to them. So we're excited to be in the neighborhood. Um, and we're also going to carve out a small, sort of 300 square foot um, section in the front of the store for Mascoma Bank to operate a small retail um, location, which I'll let Ali uh, speak to um, in a minute or so. Um, inside the store, we're going to make a genuine commitment to um, buy and support local produce producers. Um, we're going to have um, all the departments that you would expect to see at a larger store and just try and pack them in the space that we have. Um, we'll have produce and meat and seafood and grocery and dairy and beer and wine um, and, and lots of fun, fun things in, in all those categories. Um, so uh, again, we're going to be cons doing construction over the next uh, four or five months. Um, I, I, always a dangerous idea to put an opening date um, this uh, far in advance, um, but we're going to try and get it uh, open as soon as we can. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Allie, and um, I welcome questions um, at the end. Actually, if there are any questions for James right now about the market, maybe you could segue into that. You don't have to ask for right now. Um, oh, okay. it, 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 once upon a time, those small stores would often pack up stuff for people who couldn't get to the store because they just weren't able physically to get to the store. Have you thought about any kind of home delivery of your product to people? Would you think about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so, uh, yes, I would um, love to try and make, uh, find a way to make that work. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the grocery delivery business um, is expanding. Um, it's a little bit hard for smaller retailers to be a part of that. Um, but to the extent that we can uh, be a resource for uh, all folks in the neighborhood, uh, regardless of mobility, uh, we'd love to make that happen. Um, actually, I was just thinking about that yesterday, and I had an idea, like, what if you had volunteers that, like, that volunteer to, like, say someone's a shut-in or they're elderly and they can't get down their stairs or something like that? I thought that that was something that might work. Well, yeah, but some, no, Meals on Wheels is actually a very great program, but I was just thinking, yeah, like, as a, as a, I don't know if that's an idea that you can work with, but just a suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be um, working on um, a good way to uh, get feedback throughout the summer while we're um, building the store and trying to uh, figure out what's going to work. Um, I think one of the things that um, I pride myself on um, as, as a manager is to be um, open to the community, to be responsive, um, and to try and cater um, to our customers, because uh, that's, that's who matters. Um, I know that I won't get a lot of things right on day one, um, but I think that over time I will figure it out. Um, so all these sort of little feedbacks will help, help along the way. Um, bike racks. How many lots, please? Um, there are six bike racks, um, all under, all underneath um, uh, the canopy in the front of uh, the Jake's store. Um, so in theory, there'll be room for 12 bikes. Let's hope we need help. I agree. Okay. Do you guys have like a Facebook page where you're gonna keep uh, photos of, you know, of updates throughout the summer? I don't yet. Um, I hope nobody goes and steals Jake's One Market tonight. Um, but uh, I, I will do that over the summer and try and keep them updated, updated that way. Um, other questions about the um, grocery store? Okay. Um, again, thanks. Another question? No question. I'm super excited that we're getting a grocery store in the summer. We're like over the moon. Uh, so 
obviously, I'm very excited and appreciate your support. So thank you. Uh, my name is Ali Sakara. And I'm here from uh, Walnut Street, actually. I'm an older vendor, proud older vendor. And I also work for Mascoma Bank. Um, so there's a bank coming to town. Um, we are a bank that's based out of the Upper Valley. We've been around for a couple years. Um, opened in 1899. Uh, we, um, we are a mutual B Corp. So we're not only a bank that's a mutual bank, so we're not beholden to uh, stockholders. We are also a B Corp. So we're certified at a very high level to meet the triple bottom line. Um, and as a bank, uh, we came here a year before we opened any branches in Burlington area. So we already opened a branch on Shelburne Road in South Burlington, and we'll be opening up two more in Burlington, one at the Maltex building and one in the Old North End. And we opened those up because we had staff, um, two, Catherine and Joy's right here, come a year before we opened the branch just to listen to the community, just to talk to everybody, just to get to know all the businesses and nonprofits, everybody. And we heard over and over again, we made two things free meeting spaces and a bank in the Old North End. And we have that. So we'll have this bank in the Old North End and we'll have three free community meeting spaces in our Maltex building location. Um, those will be free to community members um, with the sign up situation. Um, but, you know, as a bank, we're committed to the community and the Old North End is extremely attractive because what we really care about are the people and the businesses and the nonprofits and the Old North End, it just doesn't get any better than that. Although the other locations are amazing too. Um, as an Old North Ender, I have to say that. Um, but we're really proud to partner with Jake's, with James. Um, James is extremely committed to the community and totally psyched. Is a Burlingtonian as well. Um, and we, as a bank, are very open. Uh, so like I said, we have a branch open on Shelburne Road. Um, in South Burlington. So if you want to like start banking with us early, come on over, open up a checking account or savings account, um, or just come say hi. We have free ice cream uh, from Ben and Jerry's, Chester's. We have free cabbage cheese and Lake Champlain chocolates, which are all fellow B Corps. Um, so we're really excited to be here. We can't wait to open up in September. But in the meantime, I'm going to be in the community meeting with folks um, really invested in all the businesses, all 83 businesses in the Old North End, um, and all 20, I can't remember how many nonprofits, but. Um, so are there any questions? More to come on uh, what, what, what happens next, but yes. Um, this is somebody else's one. So if somebody's decided between Vascoma or a credit union, how does Muscoma compare to credit unions? I know my credit union does not have Chester's, which is my favorite, so I think that might help. Yeah, it's basically the ice cream. Yeah. Um, so credit unions aren't banks. Uh, credit unions are awesome financial institutions. Uh, they are differently regulated and um, actually are, uh, I believe they, they, they don't pay income tax, so they have a little more leverage some ways as far as helping out a customer um, with maybe better rates in some products. But um, our bank is, I mean, what I always hear before I got this job was Mascoma has got all of the leverage and the, and the, the power of, of a big commercial bank, but with the community investment and, and the progressive values of a credit union. So, um, you know, we all offer different products at different rates, so what we try to do is just talk to our, our customers, anyone that comes in the bank, and, and help them get what they need. And um, if it doesn't work out with us, then that's, that's um, a reality that we, we can totally respect and support. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, James. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to keep it moving. Great. Thanks. Um, so next on our agenda is a discussion about the development of City Place downtown. Uh, we have two representatives from Brookfield Properties that are here to talk to us. Um, 
just a, a quick heads up. Uh, they'll be giving a quick uh, history of the project, uh, and we're going to limit that to, I think we said five minutes at most. And then if you have, we'll take comments and questions for the rest of the time. If you do have a comment, please say, say so ahead of time. We'll give you two minutes. If you have a question, please limit it to one minute, and we'll give them uh, a one minute response. Thank you. My name is Will Vogel, and I'm joined by Chelsea Ziegelbaum. We're both with Brookfield Properties Development. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity tonight to really just spend some time uh, in the community and share with you who we are and what it is we've been focusing on, what our goals are as it relates to this project. So, as I said, we're both with Brookfield Properties Development. Um, Brookfield Properties is here on the scene as part of this project because um, the original developer, uh, Devin Wood and Don Sinex, did a partnership with Rouse Company or Rouse Properties uh, back in 2017. At that time, um, Rouse was owned by Brookfield, um, but over time, sort of a larger Brookfield um, community and culture and people started to get more involved directly in the project. So by middle to late last year, um, again, the sort of larger Brookfield organization was now working directly with Don versus the older Rouse entity, which was more of a retail group. Um, that was important because Brookfield has a very deep and significant experience with mixed-use development, and that's exactly what we're doing here in Burlington is a large mixed-use development property, right? So we've got office and we have um, residential, and we have parking, and we have retail. Um, late last year, the partnership made a decision that Brookfield would become more upfront and more directly involved in the development of the project. Um, again, this is a largely a function of uh, the capabilities that we have as a company. Um, and that's why you see more of us on the scene, presenting the city council, and working hard to get to know you and, uh, and build um, trust here in the community uh, because we understand that we have a project that has had some, uh, some difficulties and challenges and our goal is to solve those things and get under construction. So that's who Brookfield is. Um, that's why we're here. Uh, the question is, um, what is it we're focusing on right now? So uh, the answer is that part of that process of us getting directly involved and again, working with our partner and building on the foundation that, uh, that our partner laid. Uh, our focus has been taking that development and bringing it to the point where we um, had the design and had it out for bid um, and, and were able to understand what our costs would be, making sure we could check all the important boxes that are necessary to check for a development to get off the ground. So things like financing, um, getting a guaranteed maximum price that's built upon real subcontractor numbers, um, and then any other number of things that we're doing to vet the project so that we're ready to get started. Um, the process we've gone through um, has some challenges. This is a big, complicated, mixed-use development, so we're still in the midst of that due diligence that I mentioned, um, and working hard to wrap our arms around where we are with the numbers and all of those elements that we know are important to address before we start construction. Because we're in the midst of that process, we're not at a point where we can give you a specific construction start date. Um, our hope is to be able to answer some of those things soon. I know it's frustrating and hard. I'm not from Burlington. I can't honestly stand here and say I can appreciate all of what you're experiencing but I think I can appreciate some of it. Um, I understand how difficult it is that there's a, uh, that there's a hole in the ground over there with, with barriers around it. And believe me, we have a huge investment here. Um, and it's, just, it's very difficult for us that we're not under construction yet. So we're highly motivated um, to get that accomplished and to build the right project for us and for you and for the marketplace. So we get it. Um, we would rather simply be over there pushing dirt around right now, so this isn't the position we want to be in. But it is sometimes what has to happen with big, complicated developments. You have to get the pieces lined up and understand what it is that you have before you go forward. So 
The only other thing I think we really just want to make clear is, um, you know, we want to become known in the community as good partners. We want you to know us as, as the face of the project. Again, that's a decision we made as a partnership that Brookfield would be here and be up front and be working with city council and with you um, on, uh, on, on understanding the things that are important to you so that, so that we can make them important to us. Um, and, uh, and that's our focus. So that's really why we're here tonight. We're certainly interested in your questions. Um, we're going to be working very hard to get this project off the ground. And um, tell us anything that you'd like to add. So we're here for your questions tonight. I have one minute left, so I'm actually one minute ahead. Um, Hurley. Thanks. Please. Just a quick note on format. Uh, can mic runners please raise their hand? Everybody can have comments. Raise your hand and eyes so these guys can get your mic. Uh, uh, Steve, if you have a comment, you'll have two minutes. If you have a question, it's limited to one minute. Again, Kevin with the big signs. So with that, with that, we'll take our first question. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Is that on? Um, so, I guess I should just be. Please, the please state your name. Okay, my name is Ben Gordeski. I live on Decatur Street. And just to break the ice here, um, appreciate you guys coming and trying to present what's going on. Um, but you're probably unknowledgeable about what's been going on with the development of this project. Probably, I mean, my, me, myself, I'm not for the project at all, and if it stayed a hole in the ground for a long time, it might be better. Um, <laughs> both the, both the, height, the height of the project is one thing, but it's not so much the height, it's what it's being used for. And it, it's mostly just a high-end development for people who have more money and with a small percentage of housing, which is called inclusionary zoning, which still isn't really affordable to my people. Um, create a lot of retail space for people with money and tourists. It's just not really what there was a whole long process that was had a vision for for Burlington downtown that we know that a lot of, some people went through to brought in representatives in the community and um, and then the mayor just went off on a tangent and pushed and pushed and pushed wherever he went and marketed. Um, done Synex's investment, and um, here we are. So that's what you're walking into. Um, probably, I'm guessing about half the people in the city are against the project. It's close. Thank you. I understand and I appreciate your perspective. We'll take the next person. Um, right there, and then you. I'm Jack Day and I live in Ward 3. Um, we're talking about two separate properties here, the construction site at Green Bank and Cherry and the vacant Macy's building. Uh, my question is, are the property taxes on those two properties uh, being paid on time and in full? Great question. I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer that. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be. As a, as a development, you pay property taxes all the way through. I'm but the, the people in Burlington are so skeptical about this whole thing yeah. that I think that should be made clear. We're happy to do that, but there's absolutely no reason to believe anything other than that we're paying property taxes. I don't look at the, those, those payments every month, but I can assure you with, with doing what we're supposed to do and, and making our payments. And for a minute, can we pause and raise hands if you, if you guys want to mic one more time? Tony, I'll go in the middle of that. Oh, Tony, what are you My question was, I, I, when I went to the, whatever the thing was when they asked us what we thought, I said, you know, when you build this housing, can you add in the people that are going to work in this mall so they can have a benefit to working there, why not give them priority housing in the building that you are building? Just as a suggestion. Interesting idea. Um, Tony Reddick and I also live in Ward 3. And in terms of credibility, 
uh, every time I go down and go downtown, uh, just about every day, I look at the huge of uh, billboards that bother a lot of people because they don't conform to the state billboard law. That's the that's the credibility that you have, which is uh, very limited. Um, uh, the Perfield Asset Management is, by the way, is a international company. It's owned 13 percent by the oil kingdom of Qatar, uh, and it just raised seven billion dollars in the market. Um, and it, according to the Wall Street Journal, at least, they have to make 13 percent of the dollar every year on their investment. So let's be very clear here: it's a private corporation making a big profit, and they need to do it here out of this project in Burlington. I'm also a member of the Group of 50, as part of the suit. Uh, the, or I should say, part of the agreement that was uh, forged with uh, now Brookfield Asset Management at the state court level. And our frustration is that, uh, first, I think we're like to know what the status, how you view that. As, I think you've indicated that that is a, a, a court, uh, that is a court procedure that has to be dealt with at some point. Number one and number two, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proponent of the project. Uh, it's, we're past the point of, of saying no project or holding the ground. We want it to be successful. So uh, and, and that's why we came to an agreement. Um, I think the key thing here is that um, maybe the project will be downscaled a little bit so that everybody's happier than they are now, and those who are unhappy, and that, that this, this uh, might be feasible. The, only other, uh, uh, the real concern we had in terms of our court agreement was that they went ahead and took out a four and a half of parking that was supposed to be available to the marketplace. That's why the group of 50 uh, uh, forged an agreement with uh, then Synex, now uh, the uh, current uh, owners. Um, so let's hopefully we can come to a successful uh, uh, conclusion. And the rent, by the way, the inclusionary rent, the, the so-called low-income rent, is $1,000 a month for one bedroom. So you can figure out if you can afford that. So as I will just mention and appreciate that feedback, um, let me just say that the owner is the same partnership. You mentioned Don, don't distinguish Don from us, Brookfield and Devonwood are the partnership that is developing the project. The concern you raised about the billboards is not lost on us. We've heard it before and, and we have just recently come to agreement that it's time for them to come down. So, Thank you. Uh, I think next we have Steve, then Jake. Um, I'll take two more questions after that. It's uh, Brian after Steve. Oh, sorry. Steve, then Brian. You then got Omar. it, bud. Okay. Okay. Two more questions. Good. Is this working? Yeah, it is. Um, glad to hear about the billboards. Just two quick questions. Who is your architect now? Truex was going to appear tonight representing some kind of further phase of the mall, but it was um, Freeman French. Have you changed architects? It still is. Are Truex anything in the project? Truex has been doing some planning studies for potential future phases, but that's really not something that is a focus right now as much as what we're trying to do to get this piece off the ground. And just curious, are you familiar with the details of the parking plan as it's been approved by the planning department? Generally. Are you looking at it hard, I hope? Well, I'm not sure I know specifically what you mean about it. Well, you've been talking a little bit to it. Part of the plan includes they removed a floor of 200 spaces and they relocated those cars into the travel lanes of the floors above. If you haven't seen it, maybe you haven't, you need to look at it. It's so totally unworkable. And even if you don't know much about parking, I think your draw's going to drop. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I think Emma's maintaining the list of people. Who has the mic? Who has the next mic? Others? Oh, Are we going to let Hello, I was going to give my spot, but if you're letting other people go, then I'll be quick. <clears throat> Speaking of the billboards, I'm, I'm curious um, if you would be willing to work with, the Burlington has a very vibrant arts community, and, and uh, also there's a lot of people who need jobs, and I'm curious if while the time is passing, instead of having, having us have to look at a giant hole, if you would consider working with local artists to put up community murals surrounding the hole, so at least, um, Number one, it would make downtown look better with the feng shui, but also it's an opportunity for you to provide work to local artists. Great, great comment. I'll just clarify, the graphics are coming down, but the panels aren't going away because we still want to make sure there's a protective screen. We're going to paint them blue. There's a blue already happening on 
with some of those panels. But we love the idea that we that once we get that done, we sit down and figure out how to do something special. Right? So I hear you, great idea. Let's figure that out. Thanks. Okay. Um, we lost the list a little bit. Can people raise their hands up again? Do you have a good, you have a good sense? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Francesca. I live on Hyde Street. I was wondering what, at this point, what is like your flexibility of changing your plans for the building? Maybe incorporating more like rent-free community spaces or more inclusionary housing? Like what is the flexibility that you have at this point? Well, I appreciate the question. The goal we have is to build the plan that was approved. Um, it's the plan that's designed, it's the plan that's out for bid. Um, and really our focus is to make it the best project it can be for what it is that was conceived. Um, as we look at other phases and other opportunities, there will be other opportunities. Right now we're not looking at, um, at any of the things that you mentioned, um, but you know, we appreciate the importance of considering that stuff and there are really three pieces of this project. There's the Macy's piece, there's the part between um, Church Street and, uh, and what would become um, St. Paul. So all of those things represent opportunities to look at what might be you know, right from a program standpoint. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danielle. I also live in this neighborhood. I had a feel like we're in Pawnee, Indiana from Parks and Rec with this big pit in our backyard. Um, because this has been going on for four plus years at this point. And I'm curious what has happened with the original plans that folks did so much work to put into. Um, for the first few months, four years ago, there were several months where there were a lot of forums and a lot of plans drawn that were from the community. I'm wondering what ever happened to those. It's a great question, but um, I can't speak to it because we weren't involved directly then. We know there were a lot of discussions and community forums, and there was an iterative process that led to where we are today. But where we are today is what was permitted and what was approved, and that's what it is we're hoping to build. But um, I, I just don't know, you know any more detail about what happened. I think those laid the groundwork for where we are today, but I can't speak to what, what happened to those plans. Uh, and just a quick check-in. Again, we'll let this go for another five minutes and we'll take as many questions as we can until then. Hey, I'm Jacob. I wanted to ask you, what is the next big step that you guys see in this project? What's the next hurdle we have to go over? Well, it's really a series of things. It's a great question. I wish it was really one thing. Um, when you're doing a multi-hundred million dollar project, uh, it, it's, it's essentially that list of things that we shared with city council. So while we have a bank on board and we have what's called a term sheet, which is a, a commitment against a set of criteria, but not uh, uh, not signed, executed loan documents, we got to take that from a term sheet to a completely fully executed loan. We have to get through this process of getting our numbers and get to uh, pricing that it is in line with where we need to be. Um, so it's a series of things that we're working on. Uh, you know, we are looking at some of the nuances to make sure that we feel like the design of the units is right. Um, but essentially, a series of things like that that I mentioned. So it's not just one thing. We have to get all those boxes checked, um, and then, then and only then, are we really in a position to start construction. That's also why it's not easy for us to give you a specific date. Um, but we're, we're working very hard. We have a, a, a big, a big focus, a lot of people working on this thing on every level. Um, and again, hoping to, to provide you with more clarity soon. Um, just wondering um, if you can talk about, right here, Brian Pine, sitting right here. Yeah. Well, right here. Um, it's really hard for, to for a lot of us, the, um, there were trade-offs, and, and many people in this room and, and throughout the city didn't end up seeing the trade-offs in the way that uh, was in favor of the project, but one of the things that made, I think, folks who have a focus on issues around sustainability and, and climate change 
we're really excited about the district energy. So I'd like you to talk about how that fits into your plan now and how you're viewing that and to hear from us that that, I think this community really, really expects and wants you to focus on that, not sort of as a tangential like footnote, but as a real core part of going forward. Well, since getting involved, we've we spent some time talking with the folks about district energy. Um, the truth is, I know it's an opportunity that requires more than just our endorsement, but we, we have they have our endorsement. Um, there's genuine interest there, especially if this is an initiative that can happen. Um, for any developer, landowner, if there's efficiencies that come from things like district energy, bring it on. It's a great thing. I've been involved in projects in other parts um, of the country where we've utilized steam that was from residual heat from nearby energy uh, suppliers. So it can be a very good thing. We're, we're, uh, we're committed to being a part of that process to the extent that, that all the pieces come together um, to allow it to happen. It, 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 it should be only good for us and good for the community if, if, that, can, if that can come to fruition. I had a question. Um, I remember that, I think I read someplace, or I read someplace, that the loan or some of the financing was coming from the Bank of the Ozarks. Yes. And can you um, tell us who the Bank of the Ozarks is and why you chose them? Sure. So um, the Bank of the Ozarks is a major construction lender um, in the market. The reason why we chose them is because we've done other deals with them in the past. Um, Don and Devin would also did play a role in um, securing them for the financing, but because we know them and we, we've worked with them in the past, we thought that they would be the right lender for this project. Um, but they're a big national country. Okay, we have our last question. Sorry, my name is Carolyn Spiegel. I live in the neighborhood here for um, over 20 years. Anyway, I'm trying to formulate my thought here, but I know, you know, thousands of hours, millions of dollars have already been sunk into this idea. We haven't had a discussion yet. But I've always wondered, how feasible or far-fetched is it to, the, the thing I always pose was not just the hype, but just the sheer mass and just the mass and the but how feasible would it be to just break it up into smaller parcels and build out a city like the way cities have organically and historically grown, like one building at a time that you can get all you want on the same acreage of land, but make it look like a city that's grown over a decade and not something like that just fell out of the sky and landed all over and fell asleep. That way you can have a parking garage as a money facility. Yeah. You can have an office building as a money facility. You can have an apartment building with retail on the lower level. Yeah. That looks like how the rest of the city grows. That is a very valid planning approach. Um, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that kind of thinking. Um, we've done it elsewhere. I've been directly involved in projects myself where, where the goal is to create this sense of, uh, of things organically coming together over time, even though you build them at once, all at once. Um, it just isn't the project that was approved and the one that we're currently hoping to get under construction. Um, but I applaud that kind of thinking. Remember, we have other phases and other opportunities. Um, but I appreciate that approach. And, and, it's, and that comment isn't lost on us at all. OK. I want to thank you guys for coming again. That's a perfect segue. We've been speaking with uh, Truex Cullen, who I believe is responsible for phase two and three. And they said they would be interested in coming and talking to our MPA as well. Right. So that's there. There will be more. This is not the last one. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to hang the mic over to Lizzie Haskell, who will be moderating the last couple uh, things on our agenda. Okay. Up next, we have our state representatives. So I'd like to invite them all up front. So you guys have 15
15 minutes total, so if we just took up about two minutes for speaking, and then that'll leave time for questions. Actually, it looks like Kurt is in here, so he'll probably each take. He's on his way. Okay, so we'll play. <laughs> carbon emissions in the state, so we did things like um, invested a uh, million and a half dollars plus in ele electric vehicle um, purchase incentives and infrastructure. We put money into park and rides and walk and bike infrastructure. We put some additional money into the state's weatherization efforts and also um, poise ourselves to potentially really expand weatherization, the weatherization programs in the state moving forward. So we did some really good things. We just, in my opinion, didn't do any of it on the scale that we need to do. We, we see the reports coming out day after day, right, about how little time we have to make major significant changes um, in, our, in our carbon emissions. And so we're, we're nowhere near to meeting our statutory goals here in the state of Vermont with the, with the actions that we took this session. And so um, I'm hopeful that we, there are some additional bills um, looking at fossil fuel infrastructure bans and something called the Global Warming Solutions Act that a number of us are co-sponsors of, and Sarah Copeland has us and I are lead sponsors of, that would actually um, put our statutory goals, uh, require the state, the Agency of Natural Resources, to develop a plan to actually meet those goals, to require regular reporting, and then to give all of you as private citizens an opportunity to um, seek injunctive relief in a court of law if the state is not upholding our permit. So we're, we're hoping to do that and we're working really hard in the Climate Caucus to kind of come back lean and mean and take much bigger action next year. So that's kind of a thing. Hi everyone, I'm Representative Jill Kerwinski and I represent Chittenden District 63, which is the Old North End in downtown um, Burlington with Representative Kirk McCormick, who is literally on his way biking here right now, so hopefully he'll get here in time. Uh, when I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we did to help families, especially um, hardworking, uh, low-income and middle-class families in our state. I've heard uh, from so many of you about the importance of finding um, high-quality and affordable childcare in our community, and we heard that and we acted on it. So we invested over $7 million in a, in a bill that would create more uh, affordable spaces for childcare in the state and do more to help retain and grow the number of providers. So we're really um, excited to be making those investments and hopefully people will start seeing some relief in their effort to find high quality affordable childcare in our community. Our state budget has some really important investments also for families that I just want to quickly read off to you so you have a sense of the scope of the work that we did. Um, we expanded Medicaid dental coverage for adults. We invested $1.4 um, in the child welfare system to address the caseload pressures um, for social workers. And, and I know that we're going to hear um, more from Ryan um, in that area. We added $1.3 for parent-child centers, uh, invested $1.5 in mental health. 2.5 million to provide a basic increase for the reach up benefits program. So that's really important. We provided families with disabled um, parents an additional $38 a month. 
We invested in nursing homes and we maintain school support uh, for programs for LGBTQ youth with um, additional funds there. And we added $50,000 for fentanyl testing strips, which is also really important. So I, um, we'll, we'll hang around after to answer questions, but again, I just want to thank all of you for, for being here and for continually sending us um, your thoughts and feedback. Thank you. Can I see the numbers? So, I'm Brian Cheenan. I represent uh, Chittenden 64 with Selena, and I live, but I live in the part of Chittenden 64 that's the old North End, which is the best part of Chittenden 64. Um, I'm pandering to the crowd. <laughs> Actually, I just didn't comment on it last night. All right, my time is ticking away. They're distracting me. So, you you all see me more, I think. Frequently saw it, and we've talked about a lot of things over the last few months. I think today I'm just going to focus for a little bit on I'm on the healthcare committee, so I'm going to talk about improvements to the healthcare system and investments in the healthcare system. So, our designated agencies provide a crucial service, a mental health service and substance abuse and um, developmental disability services, and they've been chronically underfunded. Yet they're expected to do a tremendous amount of work, and workers in that sector are not being paid fairly. But in this year's budget, we, we provide a $5.2 million increase distributed across the entire system of mental health and developmental services, and, 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 and $1.5 million to develop an electronic, an electronic record system for the designated agencies. So that's a big investment in our mental health system that's been a long time coming. Um, we're also providing $2.1 million for a 2% increase uh, for home and community service providers and the Choices for Care program. This adds funds for the SASH program to transition administration to the ACO as more Medicare lives are attributed. So that, that wording might sound weird, Medicare lives attributed, but that basically means people who are covered um, under the account of care organizations. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also provide $375,000 to the Department of Mental Health for emergency room security to try to um, provide support versus having uh, police. Um, and sheriffs. Um, and then just uh, one other thing I'd say to finish is that the health care committee in the House was focused on uh, stabilizing the health care marketplace while looking forward um, and doing some studies to look at how to make health care more affordable and to look at uh, more universal health care options as well as um, improving the continuum of care. So I'll stop on that note. Okay, now we can open up the room for questions, and if Kurt gets here on time, we can give him his two minutes, too. If you have a question, please raise your hand up nice and high so our mic runners can see. Thank you. Um, my question was about, uh, I guess it's a healthcare question, um, what about, uh, what are you, are you going to do anything to help police interact with people that have mental health is and is, is there anything addressing that there is there's a there's a so this is my third year in, in the in the house of representatives in my first in the first biennium several years ago we we created the mental health crisis commission which is a government body tasked with overviewing um <clears throat> with investigating situations involving the police and people who have mental illness who are having a crisis um, and they're still working on the investigating the situation that spawned that commission, which was when uh, yeah, Brennan, I just want to make sure I said his name right, when, when Mr. Brennan was, was killed by the police um, in Burlington. And so they're still investigating that situation, and they are tasked with um, continuing that work, and they may be looking at some of the other things. So there is, and you can um, Google them, because they're a public organization, although everything they do might not be publicly posted. You can learn more, and I'm happy to talk with you about it, or connect you with more information about the Mental Health um, Crisis Commission. So that's one example of something. that There's other things we could also look at, for example, um, some of us are advocating that the police be better trained in cultural competency, in, in uh, implicit bias, and in, 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 in de-escalation techniques. Um, and some of us have introduced legislation asking that we look at providing more funding and opportunities for the training in those areas, as well as the use of force policy. So some, just a few things. 
Yeah, I would say we also did some work um, more around immigration issues, but we have a statewide fair and impartial policing policy. It's something in my time we've had to revisit again and again and again. Um, but I think that's also a mechanism for some of these conversations. And then there are a number of bills, like Brian has a bill that is about use of force. I have a bill that's about actually more about data collection with police and judicial system interactions. So there's a there are a bunch of things floating out there that could come to more fruition before the biennium is over that would more directly look at some police oversight mechanism. facilities that exist and another thing that we've heard from providers is that they don't have um, enough opportunities for uh, education and continuing education and retaining staff and so that was another place that we took action in response to what we were hearing that I can definitely if, if that's something that you're interested in I'm definitely happy to talk to you more about that yeah, well, I've often wondered whether they couldn't just use elementary school facilities or go to the grounds and put up a, a small nursery school type facility for them. I worked in early childhood education when I was young and it's remained an, an interest of mine because I believe in preventing problems and rather than rehabilitating people. And the time to do it is in the first eight years of life, particularly the first three years. Absolutely. And the parents, and neither parent can stay home this is a good time to get the best care of their children. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's why we made this important investment. And we'll continue uh, on that track because uh, it is true that it's one of the best ways that we can help grow our economy and support the next generation of Vermonters. Yeah, let's give Curtis two minutes now. Thank you for joining us, Kurt. Climate change, investments in human services and health Okay, um, I have some answers. Uh, all right, sorry to be late. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly tell you what happened in the, uh, in the transportation bill in the end. Um, uh, we have uh, three programs uh, that may interest you. Uh, uh, one is uh, EV, electric car. Electric vehicle incentive. Um, it's only for people of moderate and low income, and it's only $5,000 incentive or $2,500, depending on the person's income. Uh, and then in that program, we also have um, a voucher program to get cars inspected for the emission controls. Um, we did three things regarding emission controls. As if you don't know, uh, if you're one of a third of my constituents that don't have a car, if you're one of the two thirds, you may be interested in this one. Ever since we have diagnostic um, uh, control in the, uh, uh, on the cars, on, on board the cars, and also at the gas stations where you get your car inspected, um, it's, you can't be fudged any longer, and any mechanics that you cannot do that any longer. It actually has to pass, and the state actually knows the information. So, 
What we did about that is we exempted any car that was 16 years old or older, that's my model year. So if the car is older than that, there's a visual inspection for tampering, but there's no uh, inspection on the, um, on the emission controls. Then um, we have a training program to train volunteers, AmeriCorps volunteers, or uh, not more, but and, uh, senior volunteers, and actually people will fix the cars for free. Um, I can tell you more about that later. I only have 30 seconds. Uh, the third thing we do is have vouchers for the cars. You can, if you're if you're of a relatively low income, you can also have um, a, a voucher to get the car inspected if the car is worth it. And it has to be worth at least five thousand um, dollars, and it has to be uh, likely to, to pass inspection if the repair is made. Um, it's a lot more things to tell you, but I'll just save it for questions. Okay, we have time for one question. Well, it has to be for me. Uh, too bad. This, my name is Jacob. Um, one is I want to really emphasize and, and strongly encourage you were talking about getting our climate goals to have more statutory teeth. And I really want to say that's super important. I work in the renewables field, and right now the Scott administration, while not openly hostile, is totally not supportive. So we really need the the statutory goals to, so that no matter who's in the administration, we see, uh, we have, we're working towards our goals. And that, the question I have is, um, I know we passed a really awesome recycling, composting bill, something or other, that had really aggressive goals, and I think the, hat, the goals have passed or something, and it doesn't seem like much is happening. I'm wondering if you guys know where that's at, and how we're gonna move forward with this, actually. So the question is for me, thank you. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's composting. Recycling's been mandatory for a long time in Vermont, although sometimes you might be surprised to run that, but uh, it is. Um, composting is we're phasing in that um, to be mandatory. It was uh, eight years, I forget when I come for it, I actually wasn't a member then. Uh, and it's actually before. I mean, these guys were members either. Um, but um, it was uh, at least eight years ago. So that eight years has come and gone, and of course the legislature extended it. Eight years wasn't long enough. So it's now nine or ten or something, and that's where we are. We're in that nine or ten period. So it's, it's composting uh, that's holding that up, and that's uh, uh, it's too bad. Is that, is that what you were interested in? Well, I guess, yeah. How are we going to actually going to make that? Well, we have to not extend it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I'm going to get serious. That's, that's the first thing we can do. And, you know, recycling is like um, a lot of things. Uh, when you say it's mandatory, when we make it mandatory, we don't have to really enforce it. There's probably, there's probably nobody in this whole country of all the mandatory programs that are, that are all around the country, including Vermont. There's probably no one who's ever paid a fine for that recycling. So it's just, when you make it mandatory, you are raising the level of seriousness about it. And the compliance does rise just with the passage of such legislation. So, yeah, I think the main thing we need to do is, is you not expect it again and say, well, that's it. And you have to be composting uh, somehow. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I mean here wanted to say something, but I think we're gonna about wrap up the state reps. Thank you guys for all of your work this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry I didn't do the interpretive dance that I promised. So, but there wasn't enough time. But I'm still working on it. Maybe the next one. <laughs> All right. Uh, one quick reminder, if you haven't signed up for our door prize raffle yet, please do that because we have two. Um, and this you're one. Still here, so you might and you're up. still here, which means you're staying. Um, just really quickly, we are an all-volunteer team. It is a labor of love. That's always the emotion we feel about this. Um, and
and we have one of our members who is moving out of our wards to the far lands of the South End. Um, so can we get a round of applause for all the work that Lizzie Haskell has done? in the steering committee is open, so if this is something you've been interested in, please come, check out a meeting, email us. Uh, we always need more people, um, especially as some leave. Um, so thanks very much. Okay, and so to end my time on the steering committee, it's time for our favorite thing to do this year, voting on the budget. So raise your hand if you're in Ward 2. Okay, now raise your hand if you're in Ward 3. Okay, great, we have to vote separately from each other, so first we have to vote on Ward 2 and then 3, and if you don't know which ward you're in, you can see cost in the back, we can look it up for you. Is anybody unsure of what ward they live in? No, great, okay. So traditionally, um, each ward gets $400. Um, from what I understand, we're getting more money per NPA this coming budget year, so it'll change next year. But So traditionally, each ward has donated their $400. To, um, they put $200 towards the community dinner because they work really, really hard to put this on every year, and any donation helps them. And then we put $200 towards the or um, the Old Olympic Community Center, so here for the space that we use, um, because they help us out a lot, and they do a really, really great job. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about where the money is going to go to? Tony. I've got a question. Uh, does Ben deal with you? Would you like the $200 to Uh, we've been looking for money to put a jacuzzi in here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what we would use the money for, continue to use it for, is to increase uh, the, facility, the the capability of this facility. So it's maintaining the sound equipment, and we have to buy more tables. So yeah, it, it, any money we get for this goes right back into what you're sitting on and standing on. So yes, we very much like. Why did you have another idea of what to do with No. <laughs> so thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, I was hoping to put a plug in to help fund the ramble. Which we did last year. Okay, so someone would have to make a motion for that in each ward. I believe you stated that it was two hundred dollars. We usually get two thirds of the budget for the community dinner, and then a third of the budget. Uh, uh, let's see, six hundred dollars we had last year to support the community dinner, so it wasn't two hundred dollars. Um, so I'm just going by the numbers on the sheet. Which, which are wrong. So, um, and we break even. And we would like to contribute um, more cooking supplies. As cooking supplies as a community kitchen have disappeared from here. So we tend to try to restock. It doesn't go to food. It actually goes to keeping the kitchen supplied with glasses. We don't have the glasses, spoons, forks, all that stuff. So not that I don't want to support the ramble is much more than, um, but we do, we, are, we break even and we don't have any projected new funding yet. We may have a future which would be helpful for the motion. I, I need to clarify something if I could. Um, before we do the motion, could I, uh, the funding level is increasing in the budget that's about to be adopted. So, um, I would ask if we, there's, there's more available to the NPA. If we're talking about the budget, it starts July 1st, which I believe we are. This is this year's funds, the funds that need to get used oh, now. Oh, year's funds. Yes. Okay. So, my only point is we can come back as NPA and allocate additional funds for our needs, whether it be the community dinner, 
even the Ramble, which is in July. We don't need July, but I don't think so. No, we don't. And this is our last meeting of the semester. So, we'll erase all that. Tony totally Reddington totally Ward, Tony Reddington Ward 2. Uh, on, as a resident board, as a resident board two, I'd like to make a motion that um, the, uh, we have uh, four hundred dollars that uh, has been unexpended to date in board two that uh, we um, uh, expend uh, based on uh, receiving receipts from uh, the uh, by the end of the month uh, from those uh, who we award money to uh, one hundred and seventy-five dollars to uh, the community dinner. $175 to the uh, to the to the common space here and $50 to the ramble. That would be $400 total, uh, 50 for the ramble, uh, 50, uh, 175 each for the community dinner and the, and the space that's uh, volunteer because we don't pay for the space by the way. Uh, and uh, that uh, that would be what we would uh, expend from Ward 2 and only people from Ward 2 can vote on this motion. Okay, is there any discussion from Ward 2? Yeah. No, we need a second. We need a second. Anyone second from Ward 2? Second. Okay, great. And is there any discussion for Ward 2 residents? Okay, so for Ward 2, you would like to allocate $175 to the community dinner. Um, $175 to the community center and $50 to the ramble. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Yep. Roll call. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like that passed. Now we got to go to Ward 3. So, does anyone from Ward 3 want to make a motion for how to divide up the $400? Um, may I, as a member of Ward 3, ask a question of our City Councilor, um, so there is increased funding in the budget. How do you know the level of the of the increase for FY20? I'm hoping I can get the attention of another councilor who's over there having a very involved conversation with a certain state representative. Um, Karen Paul, I'm going to ask on you if you could confirm the amount of funding this next year's budget has for the NPAs. Which is, which is a, okay, each NPA gets what they requested. The total allocation for eight, eight NPAs is $20,000 across eight NPAs. So it's $2,500 per ward. So that's, and that becomes available July, July 1st? July 1. So, which is great. Thank you very much, city councilors. Um, so, um, did, do the ward, is there any conversation that ward three members want to have? Yeah, I have a quick comment. I mean, what if, if the Ramble funding is something that we, you know, as a majority support, um, and that's upcoming, you know, and we're going to get more funding, uh, you know, after July, uh, what if we, you know, split the money between the, um, instead of the community center, Instead of doing all three right now, what if we just did, you know, the, the um, everything but the community center, and then we'll fund that for next year? Uh, oh shit! Um, <laughs> I'm not good at math. Can someone do it for me? <laughs> Ben can wait, so I would, we have 400 to allocate this year. I would propose, my motion is 300 for the community dinner, 100 for the ramble, and we'll revisit an allocation to the Old North End Community Center when we reconvene in, I think September is our next meeting. Okay, that's it. Second. Second. Wait, 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 I have a question. I'm okay. sorry, I'm not, I'm not for more than three, but what? <laughs> my question for both boards, we're voting on the money.
money now in June? So even though we're saying we're getting more in July, do we have to wait till next June to no. talk about this? Okay. <laughs> so we can start spending the money every year, and we always can. We just never do. I mean, it's not that it gets spent, and um, I think that the community dinner has receipts from the whole year that they can provide to us uh, before, or to, to CEDO, but we just don't actually allocate it because we're bad at it. We should do better. We always, every year we always say, we should do better, and we don't. So hopefully when we have more money, we can do better. Okay, just to clarify the relationship here, this particular section, the kitchen of this, is managed by uh, the Vermont Performing Arts League North End Studios for Champlain House. Okay. The entire building is the community center and has nothing to do with what goes on here. The monies that has been provided for us uh, here, um, everything helps. It's like every uh, nonprofit gets donations. It's a donation for us. What we are providing here is the space uh, and everything you see here, tables, chairs, sound system, uh, fans that are too noisy, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and they require maintenance. We also talk about silverware in the kitchen and all that. We're responsible for that as well. And all of us have our own ways of, of getting more stuff you know, some of the burglaries that you never hear, you know, they never get solved. We've stolen the silverware and we bring it in here. <laughs> so, but, you know, some of these things, all of these things that you're hearing about, running out of this, running out of that, we, we have all during the year, all the time, that's what I'm saying, uh, whether we get the money now or later, it, it doesn't matter a lot. We're going we're gonna to keep on doing what we're doing and we really appreciate the contribution um, by the NPA. So, um, yeah, I want to give us, like, hat, you know, most of the $2,500 after July. It's fine. You want to give us $5, that's fine. But we'll work with whatever we get. Pretty much. Okay. Okay, so Brian proposed $300 towards the dinner and $100 towards the ramble. I believe Jake the second did it. Okay. Is there any dis any other discussion? Tony, you want to Okay, so all for $300 towards the dinner and $100 towards the ramble. And if you live in more three, say aye. Aye. Anyone against it? Okay, and that passed. That was easier than last year. <laughs> and we have the door price. Yeah, now we have the door price, so you can turn your attention over to Amanda. So we can do it back here, we can do you know the next stage. Um, who would like to come and choose? How about Jimmy? All right, uh, Janet and uh Scott. <laughs> Okay. 